it's me, Dr. Larry, um, and welcome to the Living For You YouTube channel, a safe space, a place where we come together to meet, to discuss, and to talk, and to grow, and to develop ourselves into the best that we can be. That is all that we can do here uh, at this place. So welcome to Live For You. I'd like to say welcome back to all my longtime subscribers. I thank you for sticking with me and for coming to the table. I thank you for those of you who are new, welcome. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you know when I post things here on the Living For You channel and that you can be part of the conversation, you can engage and you can make comments and we can discuss and we can connect and communicate and grow. For those of you who don't know much about me or who don't know anything about Living For You, Living For You is a life coaching firm. I am a certified, a master certified life and spiritual coach. Um, I am also a theologian. I have a PhD in comparative religion. I'm also a historian. I have master's degrees in religion and in theology um, and spirituality. And so I, I'm well aware of history, spirituality, um, but also from a life coach, I'm certified in helping people. My specialization as a coach, for me personally, is to help African-American males who have experienced some trauma in their life go beyond that trauma to be able to have a sufficient life. And my key focus group are African-American males between the ages of 18 and 40. My key demographic, I talk directly to them and we try to heal to help them to live present lives. So that's me, that's the business, that's what I do. I'm a life coach, this is my business. And this channel, we have all sorts of things from life coaching to entertainment to education to just down home mukbangs, mukbangs, <laughs> and all of the stuff just for us to come together at this table. So I'd like to say welcome to you all. And uh, how are you all doing today? How, how are you holding? How is your, your life feeling at this moment? You look good, but I understand that there are things around that are going on in our world at this moment that are impacting and affecting all of us. And I would like to say, I didn't film any videos last week. My intention is to film a video every day this week um, because through this challenging time, what we need is this. What we need are these conversations and these dialogues and these direct abilities to connect and to come with one another. And so I'm going to talk about different things related to what's going on so that we can um, process it. For those of you who are unaware, who do not maybe live in the United States, I have a lot of followers and subscribers who don't live in the United States, or those of you who just are unaware in the United States, um, all of us in the United States witnessed on television the killing by a police officer of an African-American male named George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota um, on May 25th, but it aired on my birthday, <laughs> May 20, uh, May 26. And so it was very interesting for all of us because we had seen police videos, we had seen police footage, but this was more live because we were in this man's face, we were in the police officer's face, we watched as he nonchalantly killed this man, as this man pleaded for his life, saying he could not breathe, saying he was hurting and he needed to be, you know, adjusted. And the guy, the police officer, had his knee on his neck and for about nine minutes and about two of those minutes almost he had already transitioned on um, after being asphyxiated or strangled or killed and it took them a while to arrest the cops and that is what sparked the anger and so from the anger we get protest and from those protests um, we got a whole bunch of stuff from looting to rioting in almost 50 uh, almost 50 cities across our country similar situations. It starts off as a peaceful protest and as the protest goes on it turns into riotous situation. So businesses are just being destroyed. People are in their feelings and angry and hurt. I'm in my feelings. I'm angry. I'm, I'm hurt. That's part of the reason why I didn't film anything of last in last week and why if you go on my Instagram page I blacked out because I wanted to take time to just gather my thoughts before I come and I address my thoughts and I, I, I come to us to the table. I have to be collected and together in order to help somebody else to get through a moment so that they can be collected and together. And so that's the circumstance. That is the circumstance. 
Now, today's video, I want to discuss why exactly are African American people, black people, mad? You have to understand that our history in this country has been a history plagued with tons and tons and tons and tons of turmoil and trials. There's been some triumphs, but we have had quite our share of turmoil and triumph, uh, trials in this country. Obviously, you guys know, the very first African Americans, maybe you guys know, but if you didn't know, now you know. Um, the very first African people came to what would become the United States in 1619, sailing on a boat that docked into Virginia. And immediately when they came here, they came in in different forms, some as servants, some as free, some as slaves. Um, but by the time we get to the late 1600s, the 17th century, African Americans overwhelmingly, 100% are coming into what would be the United States as slaves. So we have on one hand, we have African Americans who are here, who have been here for a couple of generations by that point, who are free. Some are enslaved, and then we have, and some are kind of in the middle, right? In the middle grounds. And then, of course, we have Africans coming in consistently every year, over and over again, who are 100% slaves. And so, pretty much, the slaves outnumber from the very beginning free African Americans. And because of that connection to slavery, because even some, some African American people had family members who were enslaved and they were free. And it was just an interesting mix between free and enslaved that was happening in this country. And so because of that, the black experience in America from the very beginning was marred and tainted by the institution of slavery and the experience of it. Whether you were free or enslaved, for a, from the very beginning you were subjugated to laws to restrict you and to inhibit you from growing into your full potential and, and gaining wealth and social mobility and actual mobility, you were inhibited in that just because of that heavy, dense situation of slavery that existed in the colonies. Fast forward to when the country is founded. When the country is founded, there are over 700,000 African American people who are enslaved, who have been here for generations, Families had been here and was still enslaved. And the premise of the American Revolution and the premise of the Declaration of Independence was that all men are created equal. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. But the underlining reality of the American Revolution is that that statement, all men, didn't apply to African American people. And so continually into the creation of this country, African American people were subjugated to slavery and the association of having a system of slavery that affects the majority of the people in your population and in your demographic. So even after the American Revolution and during the beginning of the 1800s, African American people, whether they were free or enslaved, were subjugated to secondary, second class citizenship. Even at a time, in the early 1800s, late 1700s, early 1800s, um, we get influx of immigrants from Ireland and from Germany and from Scotland and from China and the West and other places. We get influx of immigrants. And African American people are still put into a second, sometimes third, fourth category of citizenship, even if they're free, having been here, born here for generations. So it continues on. Then we have the Civil War. And it is in 1863, January 1st, 1863, many of you know this, Abraham Lincoln issues his, his Emancipation Proclamation, freeing African-American slaves in states where, um, Confederate states. And then eventually we'll get the 13th Amendment that granted freedom, uh, that, that ended slavery, that said slavery in this country will not exist. But there's a clause that said, except for punishment for a crime. So 13th Amendment is an interesting compromise. Because by history, the Constitution never really addressed slavery in terms of ever bringing the institution to an end. It addressed in 1808, um, when it was written, it addressed in 18, that in 1808 that the transatlantic slave trade, going to get slaves from Africa, would end. And Congress did end that. It addressed how, slaves, how black people and slaves generally 
are going to be represented in Congress as three-fifths of a person to give southern states rep more representation based on their slaveholdings and taxation situations and trade. That's how slavery was addressed. In fact, up until the 13th Amendment, slavery wasn't even acknowledged or even mentioned in the, in the Constitution. The 13th Amendment is the first time that slavery, the word, appears in the Constitution. And so it ends slavery, but it's really a compromise that opened the door to a whole lot of things. And from the end of the Civil War up until a while, for a while, the 1960s, 70s, maybe even 80s, we get a situation where African Americans are facing discrimination, Jim Crow, racism, hostility, lynchings, being killed publicly. Now, I, I know YouTube has rules, so I'm not going to post all kinds of things, but there are postcards. There are things that you can go out and see. You just Google postcards of lynchings. You Google pictures of lynchings. And there was nobody facing any punishment for these things. So the abuses of African American people from the very beginning of people coming from 1619 all the way up until throughout the Civil Rights Movement continually abuses and killings and nobody was facing any kind of retribution um, or any kind of uh, repercussions for their actions. Fast forward into the 1980s and 90s, we got drugs into our communities. And we have situations with crack and health and low, in low income and, and poverty, which leads to higher crime and other things. And it's just a hot mess. And so what winds up happening is in the 80s, police officers get tough. All politicians, whether they're Democrat or Republican, get tough on crime. And this leads to kind of any, a lot of different things because during the Cold War, and even it intensified after 9-11, cops get all kinds of weapons and all kinds of things that kind of make them like small armies within states or within cities or counties. And so they're in our neighborhoods and the mistreatment and the police brutality and all of the stuff that happens by the thousands all the time that black people have complained about. They said that these things were happening. Police brutality led to the creation of the plan. Police brutality led to so many things because many times in many of these cities in the South and outside of the South, many of these police officers were members of groups like the Ku Klux Klan, which was a racist organization established in the 1860s as a terrorist organization against black people and white people who supported black people in the South following the Civil War. So many of the police officers were affiliated with groups like that. And the Klan was just one of many groups, but they were affiliated with that. So they thought nothing of battering and abusing. And unfortunately, in the 1980s and, and, and 70s and 80s, there wasn't really access to show this as much. When we did, we did have responses to these things. We had riots in Wilmington, Delaware. We had riots in Watts, uh, LA, uh, LA suburb in California. We had riots in Baltimore. We had riots in Philadelphia, all over the country. Um, in LA, uh, the, 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 even the diff, diff, anyway, different riots, <laughs> Detroit, all over the country in which um, we have been responding to brutality and not able to show it, but it was response to brutality that we had been historically continually affected by. And so, finally, right, 1992, LA, you guys are familiar with this, Rodney King, it's Beats on the streets of LA after a, a high speed chase and we have video footage of it being beat him being beaten mercilessly without any relentlessness and the cops are just going and going and going and we see this and we see this and it, it is aired all over on the media right all over in the media next thing you know LA is tense and what winds up happening is the cops are exonerated and LA blows up. Property damage, the LA riots, and people are angry and mad and frustrated and all of that stuff. And we thought, well, maybe that's going to be an end to this because people are seeing that people are no longer going to take this and now we can videotape it, right? Fast forward to modern times and within the last 10 years or more, we've been getting video camera footage from uh, phones We've been getting police cameras. Police have been in some states and cities required to wear video cameras on them. We've seen the footage. And countless time after countless time after countless time, we have seen black men in particular, but also black women being killed by police officers on routine traffic stops. 
being detained coming out of stores, in the car with their family, walking down the street. And we've seen it play out the same way. We've seen them being criminalized for being killed. We've seen them being beaten for being killed. We've seen it, and the cops have gotten off. People have been killed. Trayvon Martin was killed by a rent -a cop <laughs> and George Zimmerman, but he got off with it in self-defense. When we see this, and then we see at the same time other videos of other groups, white people hostile towards the cops, attacking the cops, coming after the cops, yelling at the cops, all kinds of things, and nothing happens. Nothing happens. No guns, no tasers, no anything. It's, it's like it's reserved for black people to be brutalized like animals. We don't have the right to, to respond even peaceably or not respond. We have to be quiet. And then couple all of this stuff with the continual videos of us being accosted in parks and in stores and in our houses and in our neighborhoods and on our jobs by white women and white people in general telling us what to do, asking us what are we doing, having to to explain ourselves and be accosted in all of this stuff all of the time. I've experienced it myself. And I'm like, what is it your business? I'm doing what I have a right to do, just like you doing what you have a right to do. And so all of this is reminiscent of the historical precedents of the abuses that we have faced as black people in the United States of America. So this last video of George Floyd, George Floyd's life being taken from him right before our eyes set, it, set us off. But the difference between this one and one and the many videos that we've seen is everybody's seen the videos. But this one hit home for a lot of people of all races because we saw clearly that this man was subdued, he was down, he was detained, and he was begging for his life and asking to breathe, and it went unheard, and the guy killed him right there. And it, the emotion of it, and I'm sure many of my subscribers and my followers and those of you who are new here saw the video. You can remember the feeling that you had when you were watching it, the disgusting feeling, the, the, the sadness, the inability to explain just what was happening before you. And that's what set the match off that led to these protests, that led to these riots. And at the core of it all, it's good old-fashioned racism. That is the root problem. The root problem is the racism that we are enduring for so many years and for so long. And that people are just not willing to hold on to anymore because racism has been a virus, a disease that has plagued these United States and the world, but these United States for many, many years, and it has done more damage and more violence and more harm than any other disease and epidemic we can even talk about in United States history. That's where we are. That's, that's, that's where we are, right? And my feelings on it are, I'm angry. I'm upset. I'm confused as to what will it take, what will it take for us to no longer be here? I'm sad, sad for that man's family. I'm more concerned in my own experience for young African-American males having to consistently watch people who look like them die. What is the emotional psyche that is going to be on these children? Are they going to value their life? How are you expected to value your life or somebody who looks like you life when everyone around you is proving that your life is valueless? I watched it in these schools when I've gone and observed schools. I've watched it on the streets when I watch how black men and black children are spoken to. How are you expected to value your life in the life of somebody who looks like you when nobody around you seems to be? And so I have a deep concern for that. I have a deep, deep, deep level of into, uh, inside thought about that. So I'm hurt. I'm sad. I'm angry. Not angry to lose. 
I don't believe in that type of response to stuff like this. I can understand it um, because it's frustration and it's immediate response to a situation. But I don't. Be I personally don't believe that that's the way. But I can. I can hear it, and it's not as though it's un-American. Um, if you look back through American history, from the beginning of American history, through the from the, like the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party and the riots and the looting that was occurring during that time throughout American history, the riots that we had several times, 1919, 100 years ago, was called Red Summer in 1919, the summer of 1919, because there were riots all over the country. There was violence all over the country. 1921, um, just the other day, was a, the 99-year anniversary of the Tulsa, Oklahoma, Greenwood District, uh, Black Wall Street Massacre. So that that's part of our history, the rioting and the looting and all that. That's that For, for people who say it's un-American, those are people who do not know American history, period. So I don't agree with that, but I get it. I get the frustration. I also want people to consistently stay on task with what the problem is. The problem isn't the looting. The problem isn't necessarily the cop killing George Floyd. The problem is racism. Racism. And if you don't know what racism is, I'll put a definition up so that you guys can see it. Because at the end of the day, racism has been responsible for many atrocities. Racism, to me, and terrorism are part of the same family, right? They're both used, sometimes racism used terrorism like the Klan and other groups in order to project racist ideology. But it is important to know that we have to call a spade a spade. We have to deal with the issue. So if you're wondering, if you're out there watching somewhere in the world, what are black people mad at? That's what it is. It's, his, it's his, uh, historical, it's, um, it's institutional, it's pervasive racism and the feeling of having to not be safe to be black and not to be protected to be black and not to be valued to be black in this country that we faced for many, many, many years. I'm a very educated man. I'm a very well-spoken man, as many of you see. I'm a very enlightened and balanced and spiritual thinking person. But I, too, have been the victim of racist and racism many times in my life, no matter where I'm at. I went to school and stuff in Georgia, Atlanta and everything. I faced racism there. I grew up in South Louisiana, faced racism there, and I live in California, and I faced racism here. So it's not a regional thing. It's a national thing. It's a social thing. It's a thing that we have to address as a whole in this country. Because if racism was just regional, there would not be riots and looting all over the country. Because the sentiment that I feel on the inside is the sentiment that black people feel all over the country sad, angry, frustrated with racism. Historical, systematic, institutional racism. So that's where we are. That's why we're here. That's why we're in this moment. That's why we are in the space we are in. And anybody who's known me, I've had students in my classes where I've told them, I said, we're on the verge of something. I said, because we're in a time where nobody's listening and people are frustrated. And you mix those things together and boom, you got where we are. And it could get worse, right? So, yeah, that's, I mean, I, I, I committed this week to come every day to the table because we need it. The country need it. Black people need it. White people need it. The world need it. We need voices that are going to give a balanced discussion, that are going to give a, a correct, accurate discussion, going to break through the BS, and we're going to just strictly unfilter. I didn't wear my normal, you know, I'm, I'm raw, right? I'm raw because this is what my emotions are. This is what my feelings are. I'm antsy. I'm anxious. I'm, I'm, I'm sad. I'm drained because this shouldn't be happening. But it would never happen if we get rid of the root. And at the root, it's racism. Racism is at the root. This ain't a black or white issue. This is a racist issue. We all should be against that. 
We all should fight against that. If you fight to maintain racism or if you don't speak up against it, you're part of the problem. So I've committed myself, like I was saying, for the entire week to come here to give us a place to have real meaningful dialogue, to talk, to discuss, leave comments, leave discussions. I'll address them if I have to. But we will have the discussion. We will come here so that we can grow. Because I do believe there's an other side that we will get to to it. But we want to get to it in a healthy mind, in a holistic way, from a positive place so we can get back to living present and we can get back to living our lives and coming together. Hopefully, that ho uh, somebody gave a good analogy that in order for salvation to exist, if you're a Christian, you understand what I'm saying. If not, the Christian faith is based on the, the, the salvation and the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, so if you're a Christian, you get that. Um, but the, in order for salvation to happen for a Christian, Jesus had to be crucified. But without that uncomfortable moment, without that painful moment, without that difficult moment, the good stuff that was waiting on the other side, which is salvation, wouldn't have existed. And so I will say that for this situation. While this feels like a painful, uncomfortable, distressful, tough moment, my hope is that on the other side of this, we see a different America. And in that different America, we can hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men and women and trans men and trans women are created equal. I love you and I look forward to talking to you in the next video.